Okay, uh, welcome everyone again uh, to our seminar here at the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law Under Extreme Conditions. We're fortunate to have with us today Itai Belsimanto. Uh, Itai is a, a senior lecturer at uh, Maryland University. Uh, he has his doctorate from uh, Columbia University from 2011. Um, and he uh, is also developing a profile as a public intellectual commenting on uh, various constitutional issues in Israel. Recently, he has been uh, working on uh, issues related to the coronavirus, which is what he will be speaking with us um, about today. Uh, obviously, very, very timely and um, related to a project that we're also working on here, which is um, generating um, a special issue of our journal, Mishpatu Mimshal, on uh, the subject. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, I, I would like to give you the floor, Itai. Thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure having you here. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Itamar, and all our friends in the Minerva Center, and uh, for everyone for uh, joining. So uh, as Itamar said, uh, what I'm talking about is the intersection between legislatures and the uh, COVID-19 or novel coronavirus uh, uh, disease. Uh, and, and what we saw when the uh, pandemic began is that at first, of course, there was a lot of discussion about, about, uh, sorry, uh, about the risks uh, uh, of the, the health risk and the, the health system. Then, of course, we saw the economic repercussions, but uh, a few of us who are studying legislatures found out there's another casualty of this pandemic, and this casualty has been legislatures. And uh, one of the NGOs a couple of months ago has estimated that uh, about uh, uh, two or two and a half billion people lived in uh, countries whose parliaments were closed or, or, or limited drastically due to COVID-19. So uh, this is what, what I'll present today is one article out of a larger project that tries to examine how does COVID-19 impact legislatures and in this specific project that we'll discuss today, to try to analyze why is the coronavirus such a novel and, and significant challenge for legislatures. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll start by saying generally uh, why uh, I, I think the interaction between the features of the coronavirus and features of legislatures creates, this combination creates such a challenge. And then I will focus specifically on Israel as a specific case study that adds another complication. So let's begin. So uh, one of the things that we already, of course, all know about COVID-19, and this is the reason that we're doing this as a webinar, is that uh, so far there's no uh, uh, cure or vaccine to COVID-19. So what we usually have in all countries is uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions mostly social distancing measures. And one of it, and one of the major ones, is of course, prohibiting assembling of a lot of people. Now this is a problem, of course, for legislatures because legislatures, by their very uh, nature, is a place that a lot of lawmakers meet together to debate and vote. And uh, not only that, this is something that's very fundamental to their nature, even if you think about the Israeli name Knesset, which means bringing people together, in many countries it's called assembly or congress. The whole idea is that you, you congregate a lot of people uh, or assemble a lot of people together to discuss and vote. Uh, so not only is this one of the fundamental features of legislatures, there's also something that is uh, legally required in most parliaments. Most parliaments have quorum rules, meaning that if you don't have enough people present, you cannot legally operate. This created the first uh, uh, challenge and here, even in countries that uh, do not have a, a formal legal limit, and the Israeli parliament is one of the few that does not have any quorum requirements at all, still parliaments tend to be traditional institutions that are not very quick to find solutions such as techno technological solutions, remote voting, etc. So the first challenge is that the features of COVID-19 and the control measures against the pandemic are in direct contrast with the fundamental institutional features of legislatures of, as we said, bringing a lot of people together to interact, debate, and vote. Oops. Okay, now uh, uh, the, the next challenge is that COVID-19 and its features 
also interact with the democratic, demographic features or, or traits of legislators, meaning lawmakers. And one, one of the things that we already know about COVID-19, that it's not equally dangerous to the entire segments of the population. It's more dangerous to uh, older individuals and more dangerous to, to males. And legislators typically tend to be older than the, uh, uh, their average age is, of course, older than the average in the population. They tend to be more uh, uh, male. And also, they tend to interact with people, shake hands, and their whole meeting is, their, their whole work is meeting with people. So there's, there's a real health risk here that uh, politicians and specifically lawmakers could be more at risk than other, some of the other occupations. And we already know from some uh, statistics that we have that there is a higher proportion of uh, uh, legislators and politicians with uh, confirmed COVID-19 uh, cases than the rest of the population. It's important to, to state that it's probably at least part of the explanation is that they're tested more than the rest of the population. But still, we do see around the world places where legislatures actually got uh, 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 infected by uh, the pandemic. In some cases, there were even cases of deaths. In some cases, it was quite a, a few. For example, in, in Iran, over uh, 20 lawmakers and the Speaker of Parliament uh, were tested positive. In France, about 20 lawmakers were tested positive. Of course, all of us read about the Prime Minister of the UK, who actually had to be hospitalized uh, due to COVID-19. So there is a, general, uh, a genuine health risk to lawmakers and potentially even riskier than some of the other occupations. But my argument is that although the risk is real, there's also a risk of overestimating this risk. And here I analyzed uh, some of the features that impact risk perceptions of the population in general and risk perceptions of legislatures in, in particular. And my argument is, and again, I'm not one of those saying that coronavirus is, is, you know, is bogus and not real and the health risk is not existent. But I'm saying that there's actually a risk of overestimating the risk. Part of it is general features of COVID-19, which uh, if you read the uh, scholarship about risk perceptions, it hits all, all the cognitive hot points of, uh, uh, that could cause people to overestimate the risk. But my argument is that specifically with legislatures, uh, in part because of the media, there's even a higher risk of overestimating the risk. And because we're short on time, I'll just show you uh, two examples. So first of all, take a look at this example. If you can read the title, it says coronavirus, Josh, Josh Frydenberg's coughing fit in parliament. Now, this is the story here, is a guy in the Australian parliament who coughed, okay? This story was actually featured in BBC, CNN, The Guardian, uh, hundreds of newspapers and, and, uh, uh, and uh, media sources around the world. Now, this, now I'm giving you a free eyesight exam. Can you see the last line of the small print? If you can't, what it says is that he was actually tested for COVID-19 and the result came negative. So basically it's a non-story, right? A guy coughed in parliament. Can you imagine in, a, in any other era that the whole world would be discussing a guy who coughed in parliament in Australia? So of course, this is one example of how uh, the media can create uh, uh, even more fear and, and, and the assumption that it's more dangerous for parliaments to operate than it really is. And again, it's not only theoretical, I'll show you another example. Look at this example. And this is from Kenya. Now again, look at the, uh, look at the headline, panic hits parliament as 17 MPs test positive for COVID-19. And again, free eye exam, can you read the fine print? The fine print says, but Senate speaker dismisses claims of confirmed coronavirus cases in parliament. And if you look at the next headline of the newspaper that came only a day or two after that, it turned out that it was fake news. And actually, you know, it was broadcast in a lot of uh, news outlets saying that there were 17 MPs tested positive, but it was actually not true. And what really happened is the Kenyan parliament was not hit by uh, COVID-19, it was hit by massive virus infection fears. And basically what happened there is that there were 
considering reopening, first they closed uh, Parliament because of COVID-19, they were considered reopening and they said, okay, so let's be on the safe side and test the legislatures. And then news, which was fake news, came out and said, uh, less than 17 were tested positive and immediately, of course, they canceled the planned uh, uh, meeting of, of Parliament, but then it turned out, again, it was only fears and not real. And again, I, I want to stress, I'm not saying that there's no risk. There is a general risk, but I'm just saying that uh, uh, the, the challenge to the operation of legislature is actually a, a, a combination of a real risk and the risk of overestimating the real risk. And then uh, uh, taking decisions that are uh, beyond what is actually required to maintain uh, the safeguard and, and the health of lawmakers. In a separate study that uh, I won't go into today, we, uh, we undertook a very extensive uh, empirical study that we checked the operation of uh, all parliaments in the world in, in countries of a population over a, over a million. And we checked a lot of other factors. And one of them was, of course, the extent of the pandemic in that country. And we found that there's absolutely no relationship between how dire is the situation, the real health situation or the real health, health risk and the decision to close parliament. And we saw in, in some countries that the uh, parliaments have certainly overreacted. And again, I'm not saying that there's no risk and not saying there's no need for risk for, uh, for uh, safety measures, but going from there, there to closing parliament altogether, for example, the first uh, uh, reaction in Australia was closing parliament for five months. Okay, so this, uh, I think this is the problem of uh, overestimating the risk. Okay, now the problem is that what we've seen so far is that it's challenging for legislators to operate because there's a, a, a real contrast between the institutional features of legislators and the features of COVID-19. There's a danger between the features of COVID-19 and the type of populations uh, that uh, are more at risk and the demographics of legislatures. And there is this risk of overestimating uh, the risk. And what happens is that in government, there's no vacuum. The, the other governmental uh, uh, body that goes into this vacuum is, of course, the executive branch. And what we know in general, and you guys from the Minerva know better than us, that uh, uh, in general in emergencies, when there's emergencies, the relationship between legislatures and executives tend to be tilted, sometimes tilted dramatically in favor of the executive branch. And the executive branch tends to take uh, uh, powers, including lawmaking powers from the legislature. And in some respects, it's natural. And even in some respect to a certain degree might also be justified. You do want to allow the government to take uh, uh, quick and effective measures in cases of emergency. But often, it's also an excuse used by the heads of the executive for power grabbing that is beyond what is actually uh, uh, required and uh, justified. And what we've seen in the COVID-19, that the same thing actually ha happens with COVID-19. And we see it in many countries, almost all countries around the world, in, to various degrees. And because we're short of time, I'll give two examples. Who is this guy? Do you know? This is the Prime Minister of Hungary, Oban. And he, of course, got a lot of headline, headlines of, uh, uh, and a lot of research saying that he's using the pandemic for more power grabbing and for uh, uh, further uh, uh, promoting his uh, illiberal uh, version of constitu con constitutionalism to some, uh, some even claim to the extent that uh, Hungary would become no longer a democracy. Uh, for example, Freedom House recently uh, uh, updated its uh, uh, ranking and, and said that uh, Hungary has went from the, uh, the middle category of partially free democracies to a non-democracy anymore. But the interesting thing that we found is that it's not only you know, the poster child of, uh, of uh, democratic decay countries or backsliding democracies. We saw even here, and who's this guy? This is Trudeau, this is the prime minister of, of Canada. And Canada is probably the poster child of the liberal, uh, 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 stable, uh, uh, constitutional democracy, and is you know the uh, uh, liberal prime minister. And still, we found that even in Canada, and I don't have time to go into all the details, but 
uh, when the government tried to pass legislation uh, that was mostly to help uh, uh, boost the economy and help uh, unemployed uh, Canadians, they also inserted a, a provision that would have given extensive uh, uh, powers to the executive that were not required. Basically, they were supposed to be allowed to raise taxes, lower taxes, expend as much as they want without parliamentary approval for two years. And uh, fortunately for Canada, this, this created an outcry both in the parliament and, and the media, and they backed off. But the, the, uh, the mere uh, fact that they tried, as David Eisenhower has, has, has uh, put it, it shows that uh, the temptation for governments to use emergencies, including COVID-19, to grab more powers at the expense of the, of the legislature is only, pros, only present. You actually, if you can see it in Canada, you can see it everywhere, okay? So this is uh, uh, the first part uh, of our lecture. Basically, we saw that uh, uh, COVID-19, because of this combination of the features of COVID-19, and the institutional features of legislatures and the demographics of lawmakers and uh, uh, risk perceptions and the risk of overestimating the risk and power grabbing by the executive is a novel and serious challenge uh, uh, to legislatures. Now, if you think this is complicated, here is another complication. And my, my argument is that uh, when COVID-19 meets a pre-existing political crisis, the whole issue is even more compound in some respects, it's even more exacerbated, but we'll see that in some respects, it might actually also help or be an opportunity for legislation. So what I'm doing, I'm taking Israel as, uh, as the uh, case study. So uh, we have non-Israelis here as well, right? Do I have to say a few words of, to explain the political crisis in Israel? Maybe just a couple of words. Okay, so very, very briefly, uh, when COVID-19 reached Israel, the Israeli parliament was in a very weak uh, uh, position because it was after three rounds of elections, after uh, these two uh, uh, main ca uh, uh, candidates, this is uh, Netanyahu uh, and, uh, and Benny Gantz, each of them was not able to form a, a, a government. So we had three rounds of elections in a row, which is uh, 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 not a world record, but certainly uh, unprecedented for uh, Israel. And what happened is that uh, in mid-March, uh, Parliament was sworn in after uh, three rounds of elections already, and we had a caretaker government headed by Netanyahu. But there was, at the time, a majority of Parliament members who opposed Netanyahu, and therefore the President gave the mandate to Benny Gantz to try to form a government, but he was also not able uh, uh, or unsuccessful to form a government. And the majority of, at the time in parliament threatened to uh, use its power to enact legislation which would prohibit Netanyahu from forming a government. And this is because there's another co uh, a compounding factor here is that Netanyahu's uh, uh, trial for serious corruption charges was supposed to begin one day after the swearing in of uh, uh, of parliament, so they wanted to pass legislation saying that uh, a politician who is indicted for serious corruption charges cannot form a government. So we had a situation where we had a very weak and newly sworn parliament. We had a political deadlock that lasted a long time. We had a caretaker government for uh, roughly 500 days. Okay, again, not a world record, but certainly unprecedented for uh, Israel. And we had uh, the head, the prime minister of the caretaker government was threatened by the new majority by parliament. This of course creates a very big temptation to use the coronavirus to stop parliament from operating and trying to operate against the prime minister. And this is exactly what we saw. And I, I, I claim that the, uh, the story of the Israeli parliament is a story in, two, uh, act, in three acts or three stages. And the first stage right after uh, parliament was sworn in, what I just uh, told you about, was uh, we saw attempt to shut down or limit parliament's uh, operation. And basically, uh, very briefly, there, there were several uh, uh, attempts, but the two major ones was that uh, the outgoing speaker, which was from Netanyahu's Likud party, uh, tried to prevent 
the Knesset from meeting and voting for a new speaker and also creating new committees that would allow parliament uh, uh, to operate. And the other thing, and perhaps even more troubling, is that it was uh, revealed that uh, when the government passed the coronavirus regulations, governmental regulations and, and health regulations for the general population, they wanted to use it to close down parliament. And according to the newspaper reports, the prime minister and several other ministers from the Likud were actually supportive of it. But the attorney general said it would be unconstitutional for the government to use emergency regulations to close down parliament. And the majority of ministers accepted that opinion. And, and finally, it did not uh, materialize. But there was still the case of the speaker of the Knesset to try to prevent the Knesset for, uh, from starting to operate. because. If you do not elect a new uh, speaker and you don't create the committees, of course, there's no possibility of enacting legislation or undertaking serious uh, uh, parliamentary oversight of the government. And this created a situation where the Supreme Court uh, intervened. And this is uh, the Israeli Supreme Court is relatively uh, active uh, in terms of its uh, ability and, and, and willingness to intervene in parliamentary uh, decisions. I should still say that in the vast majority of petitions, the court does not intervene. In this case, the court, uh, in a very dramatic decision, actually did intervene and said to the speaker of the Knesset, you must open up the Knesset, you must allow a vote for a new speaker, uh, you must allow the committees to uh, start to operate. It seemed that the, the outgoing speaker was willing to uh, allow the committees to form and to operate. And here, again, there was Coronavirus was used as an excuse for those things as well, but I don't have time to go into it. But he was not willing to obey the uh, court's decision to uh, have a vote for a new speaker. And this created a constitutional crisis. And you see how when COVID-19 crisis meets a political crisis, uh, they have a new baby, which is a constitutional crisis. And here, as the Supreme Court claimed, it was the first time ever in Israeli history that uh, uh, that uh, a, a, a senior official of the state says that he's not willing to uh, to obey court decisions. Finally, uh, the petitioners had to come again to the court, and the court found some original solution that uh, uh, gave the power to uh, open Knesset and open the Knesset and have uh, the first meeting for the for a vote of a new speaker, and then eventually. The Knesset did comply as an institution, and the, the, the outgoing speaker, I, I should say, uh, preferred to resign rather than comply. But then, as I said, uh, they found a, a solution. And as an institution, parliament did comply, and then parliament did begin to operate. And then we moved to the second stage. In the second stage, uh, uh, there was still no government. There was, uh, 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 parliament was already operating. It had a speaker. It had the committees. Uh, but the government was not formed. And in this second stage, something interesting happened. Actually, there was even more legislative activity and more legislative oversight than many of the uh, stable democratic parliamentary uh, uh, countries around the world, and more than there's often in Israel itself. And one of the reasons for that is because of the unique situation of a political crisis that we did not have a government yet. There was a car our caretaker government, but we had an operating parliament. Most of the important committee, including a special coronavirus committee that was formed, were headed by uh, the opposition, meaning by uh, members of parties who were not part of the caretaker uh, government. And they were actually quite active. If you look at the different various measures, we don't have time to go into it, but in various measures in terms from beginning from the, the formal ones, how many times a week they meet, and to the extent of uh, uh, the reports they created and the, and the debates they had, etc., they were quite active, at least in the oversight end, a, a, less, uh, uh, a bit less in terms of lawmaking. But, uh, uh, but in, in general, what happened here is I think the combination of this uh, uh, political crisis and the COVID-19 crisis that actually created much more political, media, and even public awareness of the importance of parliament, they combine together to actually make a more active parliament. And what happened is, if, remember I told you, we had 
uh, three rounds of elections. So for a very long time, we had a parliament that was almost not operating. And it seems that you know the media and most of the public did not care too much. But because of the COVID-19 and the, and the feeling that the government might use this to, uh, uh, to undermine democracy, suddenly there was much more attention, I think also by the Supreme Court, and this is, might be another uh, explanation to the Supreme Court's decision, but certainly by the public and the media, and I think legislators themselves, why it's so important to have parliamentary activity and to have parliamentary oversight, to the extent that when I told you the outgoing speaker was not willing to open parliament and, and hold a vote for a new speaker, people actually went to the streets and started demonstrations. Okay, so, uh, so ironically, co the combination of the political crisis and the COVID-19 crisis created more parliamentary activity and more parliamentary oversight than usual. And then we reached the third stage, which is after the new government was eventually formed, it was about two months after uh, uh, parliament was sworn in. Uh, and then uh, what happened is that uh, on the one hand, the political crisis is officially over, although there's a lot of cracks in how this government is operating, but officially the deadlock is over and finally we have a government after almost 500 days of caretaker government. But one of the things we saw is that parliamentary operation, especially parliamentary oversight, actually suffered a lot from it. Uh, mainly because, uh, uh, I mean, there's again a lot to say, but briefly, mainly because the, the heads, the chairs of the, uh, of the committees, including the coronavirus committee, became again headed by the, uh, by the coalition and not by the opposition. And, and, and uh, to add to, it, to that, we, see, we saw recently uh, uh, two major me measures. One is that uh, the government used its new majority to pass coronavirus leg legislation that gave it a lot of uh, uh, lawmaking or semi-lawmaking powers and limited the ability of parliament to, uh, to create oversight of this uh, um, regulations before they get into force. And also when the head of the coronavirus uh, committee wanted to uh, actually do her job, and ask questions and not automatically uh, approve whatever the government regulations wanted to do. It was extensive political pressure on her, including threatening, threatening her that uh, she would be uh, uh, taken off from the, uh, being chair of the committee, that she would have a, a, a personal sanctions from her uh, party, that her political, uh, uh, political future is over, et cetera. So now we see, uh, again, a relatively weaker uh, parliament. And, and what's more troubling, an atmosphere that the government is promoting that, that sees parliament more as something that uh, uh, needs to, uh, as a hurdle that needs to be quiet and not intervene with the government's efforts to uh, fight with COVID-19. So uh, to conclude very briefly, so we'll have time to, uh, for discussion, um, we saw uh, several things. First of all, in the general overview, we saw, I think, why COVID-19 is such a challenge for legislatures and why this is a unique and I think even novel challenge. Although if you take Israel, for example, of course, emergencies and from other types are not new to Israel and still uh, COVID-19, uh, because of this combination that I discussed of the features, the specific features of this pandemic, and the features of parliaments, lawmakers, and risk perceptions of lawmakers, et cetera, this creates this novel and, and significant uh, challenge. We saw that when you have a political crisis, uh, it actually exacerbates the situation and also exacerbates the temptation of the caretaker government to use this uh, 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 pandemic as an excuse to avoid parliamentary oversight. But we also saw that uh, it could be actually an opportunity to parliament because there's, I think, more awareness than in the past of the importance of parliamentary activity and parliamentary oversight. And I end by, uh, we talked about the challenges, I'll end by th this and with the positive uh, uh, argument that uh, although it's a, a significant challenge, I think most parliaments, certainly in stable democracies, are capable, certainly institutionally capable, of meeting this challenge. 
And what we've seen around the world recently is that there are parliaments that continue to operate, and some of them are actually performing quite well and showing ability to adapt and resilience. And I think uh, uh, for the sake of democracy, it's very important for parliaments to continue uh, to operate. As, as the speaker of uh, the EU parliament says, uh, parliament must remain open because a virus cannot bring down democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Itai. Uh, that was uh, fascinating. Um, let me uh, quickly move to Professor Gad Bozilai, Bozilai uh, for um, a set of comments. Um, and then we will hear uh, Professor Elisa Zbrke as well. Thanks very much, Itai. It's a very intriguing topic and uh, partly uh, because it's not well discussed. I mean, mainly we are referring to issues of uh, uh, judicial review and constitutional judicial review, but we are inclining to neglect uh, the issue of legislation. By and large, in fact, I think that uh, faculties of law incline to underestimate the issue of legislation and to overestimate the issue of uh, judicial reviews. So your paper, I think it's uh, certainly um, a fresh wind in, in the correct direction. Uh, secondly, and this is actually uh, maybe a comment that you would like to, um, uh, to take on, uh, to begin with, we should ponder why activities of parliaments have not been halted, uh, suspended uh, during emergencies. You know, because if we take classical uh, Carl Schmidt or, Ag or Agamben uh, on the other end, we may expect parliaments to be halted, suspended, disseminated, uh, it has not happened, uh, certainly not in Israel, uh, and in other places as well, uh, by and large. Um, so th those are kind of an opening comments, and then I have three questions and uh, also a methodological caveat at the end. So, so one question to you, if you'd like to drill more in depth into the issue of how parliaments are using or monopolizing crisis like pandemics in order to gain more institutional power. You know, kind of a reali realism reading of pandemics. So this is one question um, for you. The second one is about politicization of the, um, of the crisis, which in a way was a bit missing in your, um, in your lecture. I mean, we, are, we, we, we see approaching or even looming, depends <laughs> how you see it, elections in, on November 3rd in the US, um, we see how different politicians in Israel, including Gantz and Netanyahu that you mentioned earlier, are politicizing uh, pandemics. And I think that here you have a kind of um, a theoretical or conceptual point to drill more in depth uh, into it. Last and not least, the whole issue of prof professionalization. How parliament members are using professional knowledge in times of uncertainty. Let's say medical doctors or jurists. So only recently a graduate of mine uh, submitted a PhD uh, that was approved about the how does legal knowledge of parliament members are affecting legislation. And actually his, main, his name is Salim Brick. I should give him all the credit, obviously, from the Department of Political Science. And the co-mentor was um, Professor Ranem. And the, the uh, conclusion was that legal knowledge, in fact, has not affected 
legislation at all, which is a bad news, or maybe a good news, but certainly a, a bad news for faculty of law. We don't really affect through education processes of legislation. And I, I would wonder what is going on during a pandemic crisis. Just to end with a methodological uh, caveat, I think that you have a skewed sample because, and you mentioned it yourself, we are talking about a, a, a post-electoral crisis in Israel. We are talking about a national unity government and our non-Israeli viewers should be consulted that in Israel, when you call a government a national unity, it does mean that it does not have a unity at all, right? So this is why they call it national. So you have, I think, an outlier. Israel case study, I think, regarding your paper, might be an outlier, and the question is how you would like to deal with it uh, in your paper. But thanks very much. It's a wonderful topic and a very good paper. Okay. Thank you very much. So there's a lot here, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Maybe I, I won't go into uh, uh, all of it. Maybe I'll go in reverse order. So starting with the methodological uh, question, I, I completely agree. In, in that respect, uh, what, one of the things that I tried to do in this specific article is to, to have a general, uh, the first part is more a general uh, uh, analysis that draws upon experiences from around the world and then a separate uh, uh, case study. And, and I have no pretension of saying that, no, the, the Israeli case study is indicative of what's going on around the world. And this is one of the reasons this is only the first article in a number of, uh, of articles uh, we're undertaking uh, with colleagues. We're also, as, as I said, uh, undertaking a very extensive comparative uh, uh, study that covers many parliaments. So I, I wholeheartedly, uh, agree with the methodological point. I think, I mean, it's it's still, of course, useful and interesting to look at Israel. And I think, uh, and, and as I mentioned in the article, there were other countries now that uh, had, at least in some respects, similar features that uh, they had minority governments or a prime minister uh, uh, with corruption charges or so or other type of, of political crisis. So you can, uh, I think theoretically uh, undertake a follow-up uh, uh, study that would examine the subset of countries who are uh, dealing with a political crisis. And I can think, for example, of uh, Belgium or Ireland or Luceto or Macedonia uh, that had some similar features and see in those specific subcategories, because I completely agree because that the situation, I mean, that's part of my point that the, the specific situation and the political crisis does impact the, the general uh, uh, operation of parliament. So, so I completely agree. Uh, in, in the question about the uh, professionalization and the impact of uh, how parliaments use legal knowledge or medical knowledge, I think it's fascinating. And first of all, congratulations to your students and I'll be very happy if you could email me uh, this uh, uh, study. Was it uh, specifically about Israel or? Yeah, it's mainly about Israel, but it does include a huge data set. So if you send me an email tomorrow morning, I will send you a link. I will CC also the author himself, Salim Brick, and he can send you a copy of the dissertation. But it's a big data set about professional knowledge and legislation in Israel. So, so this is something I'll be very interested in because in my other hat as a legisprudence scholar, we, we talk a lot about the importance of... Uh, evidence-based uh, lawmaking and, and taking into account uh, both uh, uh, professional legal uh, drafters uh, advice and, and but also impact assessments by professionals and, and experts and, and scientific data from other uh, uh, areas as well. I think that from my experience Israel is like actually uh, one of the less less advanced in at least in the you know in the western if you compare it to uh, the EU and some uh, EU uh, member countries, I think there you do see that there is some growth in evidence-based decision-making and also uh, more uh, um, influence by, by professional, including uh, legal uh, uh, experts. I, I can tell that in one of the conferences that uh, 
that I did a number of few years ago with the Israeli Knesset. We call it legisprudence in the legislative process and how can you use the theory of legislation to improve the legislative process. And we did one day in Barilan and the second day in, in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament. And intentionally, in the second day, I brought leading experts from the OECD and, and Europe to talk about evidence-based and impact assessments. And I can say honestly that uh, the Israelis scoffed about it and say, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, the assumption that you can have an evidence-based rational lawmaking process in Israel is, is not realistic. I think part of it is legal culture. I think Americans were also scoffed, but in the US, uh, I think, but, but sorry, but in the EU, you do see that of course, always there's politics. And I think rightfully so. My personal opinion is that we need to have some balance between the elected uh, uh, parliament members and the professionals. You don't want a country where the technocrats are completely overriding uh, uh, the parliament members. But I think in Israel it might be a bit skewed too much, skewed too much uh, to the political and non-evidence space. By the way, in, in our uh, special issue in the theory and practice of legislation about parliaments in time of pandemic, there's a very highly recommended article uh, about uh, uh, how uh, medical uh, experts are gaining a lot of influence. The guy is from Australia, but he's making a more general claim. He's saying that in many countries now, you see that actually the medical experts uh, are, you know, they're probably uh, uh, equivalent of Balsi or Gamzu uh, are actually not, uh, are not only decision supporters and only just giving the facts, but also become the decision makers. So actually, uh, one of the arguments is that the pandemic created a tilt, and some would say too much of a tilt to the other side. And for us as legislation uh, scholars who have preached for a long time that the importance of evidence-based and, and science-based uh, lawmaking, to a certain extent, it might be careful what you wish for. So I think it's a matter of right, finding the right balance. Uh, okay, okay, do I have time to answer the others or should we take more time? Yeah, I, would, I wish was, we move to uh, some other questions because there is already uh, a kind of queue. Uh, so I um, would like to invite the Professor Elie Salzberger to give his comments. And then we also have Amnon Reichmann and Robert Neufeld uh, coming after that. Uh, thank you very much, Itai. I uh, concur with uh, Gadi that the focus on legislature is a refreshing focus for us uh, law scholars. My main methodological question is how you really measure the importance of legislature or the role of legislature, especially if you want to draw conclusions to what happened to legislators in time of crisis or even in the Israeli specific case? Do you measure the number of meetings of legislators? Do you measure the number of oversight, the number of laws, uh, whether it's laws by uh, uh, private bills as opposed to government bills? The measurement of the importance of a legislator, or you try to put also qualitative uh, measures, is, is an essential thing in order to draw conclusions. Uh, my two remarks are with regard to the two uh, um, parts of your uh, lecture. The first part, the general part, uh, you know, you characterize COVID-19 as a specific crisis that have a specific effect on legislators because, for example, the demographics of uh, male higher aid, but this is true for all public figures. So this is not a distinctive element for legislators, also governments and other uh, uh, senior public officials are more uh, gender uh, male orientated, are uh, above average. So there is something else. And I would put forward to you that it's not the specific characteristic of a pandemic, but the crisis, a crisis or extreme condition, and it can be, you know, extreme condition from various kinds, also war, uh, which might affect. And of course, I think also your um, data with regard to which parliaments were more affected, not corresponding the severity of, uh, of the pandemic, shows that it's something else, that it is, you know, every extreme condition or crisis in an opportunity for some powers to try to overcome other powers, especially the executive trying to curtail the powers of a legislator. 
And this brings me to the second remark with regard to your, uh, to Israel. Um, in a sense, you know, part of your three stages correspond to the general literature. You know, if you have a weak government, you will have a stronger parliament. If you have a strong government and unity government, which reflects uh, 80 members of parliament, then by uh, uh, you, you can expect to parliament to be of uh, lesser importance or lesser uh, uh, effect. Um, but the Israeli case is really interesting because even I think after the third stage in which we have a government, uh, there is a paradox between the formal powers of parliament, which were decreased by the fact that we are ruled by emergency legislation and even by emergency legislation that was empowered specifically for this pandemic. Uh, so in for, from a formal perspective, the power of parliament decreased but actually if we look at what parliament uh, uh, affected from the surveillance by the G G uh, gs uh, from the general secret service to uh, and you know uh, overruling government decisions with regard to closure of uh, uh, various places various kind of businesses uh, you mentioned it i think that actually the power of parliament in the current crisis uh, again depends how you measure um, is uh, not, I think, less uh, than uh, the power versus the other uh, branches of government before the crisis. So these are two, my two remarks, but excellent topic, and I hope that we'll continue talking about uh, the role of legislators. Hi, right, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a very uh, helpful comments. Uh, so let's start uh, in their order. So the methodological point of how do you measure, this is the $1 million, question, $1 million question. And this is something we're grappling with in our other projects. And I can tell you what we did in, in our other project that I did not, I just mentioned today, but did not present today. Uh, the one that we tried to measure parliamentary activity in all countries above a million. And there, you must have a quantitative uh, measure and what we did, we actually created a novel index. And, and uh, the index uh, uh, basically tries to examine the more, I'll call it a quantitative or official aspects of uh, to what extent parliament is meeting, to what extent they move to use remote uh, or technological solutions, and et cetera. And also try to see to what extent it's, it's uh, uh, because of the COVID-19, because one of the challenges is that various parliaments around the world uh, do not meet as regularly as the others in normal times. For example, the Chinese parliament meets much less than many uh, Western uh, European parliaments. So we created a, a novel uh, uh, index, but the, the caveat is that it, this is the index of uh, the first uh, type of uh, measures that you mentioned is the first measure, the more quantitative aspect of are they even, you know, first of all, are, are they open or closed? But also we, we, we are understood that there's nuance of if they're open, to what extent they're open. I mean, did they uh, have less meetings than usual or, or uh, et cetera? But still, it's, it's the, the first layer of the examination. The, the most basic and first layer is, are there, did they close down or are they operating? And to what extent are they operating in media? And this is important in itself because, as I said, we saw that over two billion people lived in countries where Parliament was shut down completely. But, but I completely agree that this is only the first stage. Follow-up studies will have to examine more qualitative aspects because in some countries you can have Parliament operating officially, but doing because, for example, if you look at Hungary, one of the interesting examples about Hungary is that uh, they did not close down Parliament. But because the government there, the, the government uh, party has a super majority of over two thirds in parliament, they do not need to close parliament, right? So, so uh, the question of whether parliament is operating is, is the first stage. And, and I completely agree with your other measures and the follow-up studies, if we won't get exhausted from this subject by the, by the time, would be more qualitative studies. And then we would not be able, of course, to do it for 160 countries, it would be uh, a, a smaller subset of countries, but I completely agree with your methodological point, which is directly on point. As for the demographic, the, your second point, uh, that the demographic features of uh, legislatures are not different than 
democratic uh, features of uh, uh, heads of the executive or senior officials, I agree. If you look in Israel, for example, or in the US, there's certainly, they're also in the risk, the prime ministers or president are also uh, in the risk group, but I think there's still a difference. And you can see it actually how it operates that for governments, it's easier to move to remote operation and they don't have to meet physically to, to act. And this is we saw it with the government that they had all those uh, phone uh, uh, meetings instead of meeting in parliaments, moving from uh, meeting a lot of people together to uh, remote operation is much more difficult because of the institutional features. So I think the combination of the demographic features and the institutional features together, it's what, what creates a higher uh, uh, challenge for uh, legislatures. Having said that, I do agree with you that a lot of it is something that is more general about crises and how uh, executive branches tend to use crises to, uh, to take powers from parliament. Th 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 this, I completely agree. Uh, in, in terms of uh, your follow-up uh, point that uh, uh, it, it actually our findings from the other study that showed that there's no relation between the severity of the pandemic and the question of whether parliament closed down or not. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that it necessarily means that the, the challenge here is not COVID-19, but it does mean, as, at least as I interpret our findings, is that uh, uh, two things are, are happening, two major things are happening here. And, and here I would actually agree a lot with what you said. One is, is an overreaction and just fear. And the other is opportunistic use by uh, executive branches to uh, avoid parliamentary oversight and parliamentary activity. So with this, I, I completely agree. Um, in, in terms of maybe I'll, I'll save the, uh, uh, the last point about uh, the Israeli parliament to, to hear more people or, or should I answer? What do you say, Tamar? Uh, no, I think we should answer actually. Uh, okay. Quick, you can. Okay, I'll, I'll try to do it uh, quickly. So it, it, it's, it's an interesting question whether now in, in the third, what we call the third, third stage, uh, the Israeli parliament is still uh, a more effective? I, I think you're right that it's still more operational uh, in terms of if you measure only the uh, uh, features of uh, the quantitative features, I think it's more operational than many uh, uh, parliaments in very respect respectable parliamentary democracies. In terms of how effective it is in, in terms of uh, uh, affecting uh, policy, etc. And, 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 and effective oversight? I'm not sure. If, if I remember correctly, the, the surveillance, uh, the surveillance by the security agency, internal security agency, uh, it was blocked before the w w in the two months when the parliament was still uh, operating without uh, uh, with the caretaker government. And and what we saw is that eventually the current government was able to uh, pass it. I agree with you that there was this case with the coronavirus uh, uh, committee that they managed to block, uh, uh, but, but if you look at what they managed to block, I mean, it, it got a lot of headlines, but they blocked very two specific uh, uh, initiatives of closing pools and gyms. And, uh, and then I see it as actually as the exception that chose the rule, right? Because especially you see the backlash that she received and the threats, I, I see it as that uh, she was the exceptional uh, 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 chair and the very strong message from the government is if anyone else would uh, be as activist in its oversight, uh, they will pay significant political, uh, personal political prices. So I, I'm a bit more skeptical and, and perhaps less optimistic about the third stage, but it's, I, I, in general, I'd say it's too early to, say, to, to, to tell and I think in general, you know, we have a tendency to say, you know, uh, uh, to, to uh, be too quick to say, you know, our democracy is uh, dismantling, et cetera, and time after time, Parliament and, and the Supreme Court and the public and the media show that Israeli democracy is more resilient. So I'll be happy to, to accept your optimistic uh, view of what will happen in the, in the third stage. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I, I will just uh, note that we have here uh, also attendees that are not part of our uh, regular group. And one of them has uh, also asked a question uh, through the chat. 
one that I think is maybe not exactly um, directly related to your arguments, but still, I would be curious to hear what you think. Uh, so Shmuel Yerushalmi writes um, that uh, he's from Bill Sheva, the lecture just started, um, but he has a very important issue to raise, namely, why do you not um, address the possibility that the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, intentionally generated by multinational corporations in order to destabilize political systems around the world. So if you have any thought about that whatsoever, um, uh, we will uh, give you a chance to respond to that. Otherwise, uh, we have Amnon and uh, Robert uh, following up. Okay, so uh, I would say that I'm not a medical expert and I'm not a, 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 a scientist who studies uh, viruses or epidemics. So, but I can say that because of this project, I've read more uh, medical uh, journals than in my entire life, but still I don't see myself as an ex uh, expert to answer. I can say just, you know, from like anybody else who reads, I, I heard a lot of arguments and, and conspiracy theories saying that uh, there were in the, either intentionally by corporations or by the Chinese government. To the best of my knowledge, so far, there was no uh, uh, study that uh, has proved it. I'm not saying that it's necessarily not true, but I don't know any study that uh, actually proves it. And I think our argument is actually stronger if we don't come up with saying, listen, this uh, uh, pandemic is all a hoax uh, 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 that uh, was invented, but actually say, we realize there is a genuine health risk here, but this does not mean that we should allow it to uh, bring down democracy or parliament. I guess I, I guess the part of this that is most uh, relevant to your uh, argument is the is the factual question of whether there is something like a general destabilization of political systems around the world due to this pandemic or not. I don't know if that's possible to say. So uh, I think. Generally, I see we do we do see uh, a, a general trend of uh, um, I'll say generally, and then I'll say what we saw in our because we focused on parliaments. But generally, uh, we do see a trend of of executive uh, uh, and governments taking more executive powers and taking more right restricting powers around the world. Uh, we do see fears to uh, especially uh, fragile democracy or, or, or backsliding democracies. Um, at the same time, I think we've seen a lot of, especially in the more stable democracies, that uh, it, it did not uh, destabilize governments that much. It, it did challenge governance around the world for sure. And uh, what, I can, what I, can, I can tell you more, and I can refer to uh, a very interesting study by uh, Ginsburg and Velstig. Uh, Tom Ginsburg, that uh, they actually examined how this emergency impacts not only parliaments, but generally governance around the world, that they actually are not so pessimistic in their general uh, findings. What I can tell about specifically about legislatures in our other study that examined much more, uh, 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 much more uh, uh, larger uh, data set, uh, we generally found out that uh, parliaments are like uh, a patients. So uh, you know that patients, uh, if if you're young and you're healthy, you would not be impacted by COVID-19 that much. But if you if you're older or have uh, uh, background uh, uh, health issues, uh, you're much more at risk. We found out that that's very similar to parliaments. In stable democracies, they were relatively unaffected. In uh, fragile democracies, they were the most affected. Okay, thank you, uh, Amnon. Uh, I give it uh, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ita. It's always wonderful to hear you. Um, I'm going to address your presentation on three levels. One would be just a few comments on, on the comparative dimension. The other would be on what is unique about crisis situation and more specifically the COVID. And the other has to do with legisprudence. So basically, it's the things that you basically touched upon. So, um, so I'll start with the comparative, and I'll be very brief here. I think here in the comparative, we see one of the most stark examples of the tension between a small n great resolution and large n more simplistic 
type of analysis because the, the fewer ends you have, preferably even only two ends, you can actually make something more meaningful. Otherwise, you descend up to Tom Ginsburg and, and Mila's point about statistically, generally, so here's an invitation. We can write a, an article together. I think that part of your re, part of what you say, with respect to the health and the young and the and the youth and etc., requires. I mean, you can take some some um, key paradigmatic cases. Let's take Israel and Germany together. That's a great uh, gif uh, here. We can we can together apply for a gift. And to tie onto that, you say there is this issue of what is the rule and what is the exception in terms of what is the message that comes across between governments and, and parliaments. And you see a totally different scenario in, in Germany and, 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 is, and has to do also with the, with the engagement of experts. You see a totally different scenarios, scenario in Germany where you see Merkel um, uh, using experts a lot, giving a lot, a lot of uh, airtime and credits to experts from the get-go, you see in Israel quite the opposite, number one. Number two, what you say is that you see a threat from the government to parliament. Oh, if, if you do anything, you see a, a, a threat on the political level. We're going we're gonna to take revenge. We're going to make sure that you do not compete in the next cycle of elections or personally to, to people who might voice opposition, whereas, whereas in Germany, we saw the split. We saw Germany saying, we need consensus in parliament. So the opposition parties told the government, don't even consider uh, contact tracing. I mean, you might want to think about it, but if you do, we're going to launch all oppositional uh, uh, procedural tools within our powers, and it's going to be a much more rough ride for you. And the government said, no, we're not going to even engage contact tracing that's off the tables in order not to... So it's an interesting comparison. Okay, so that's a point of comparative, um, just an invitation to do a GIF, but, but, but I think that the, there's more to it because I think, I think it doesn't necessarily follow. What you're saying doesn't necessarily follow because there could be other paths and then it becomes an issue of context and, not, and the narrative you can, tell, you can say about each system provided that you're telling the story of a small n comparison, number one. Number two, this notion of uh, um, what is unique about crisis situations. So, so what, what is interesting, and we do a lot of that in, in Minerva, so we've had some mileage on that. It's the issue, one of the things that separates crisis situation, and I'm talking about emergencies, not, not overall extreme conditions. I'm talking just about emergencies, is that even though you know the contours of the emergency, you know it's a pandemic, the, there is a higher degree of uncertainty and therefore this notion of the shift from evidence-based to best available guess is really central here. You no longer look for evidence as in evidence in the first stage, what you call the first stage, but rather on the best, best estimation. You know you don't have evidence. In fact, it's flip. You will not have evidence. You cannot wait until you have the evidence, which is a second component. There is the time factor. So it's a lack of credible evidence. It's a shift to guesses in your intuition or whatever it is that experts sometimes de generate, which is not evidence-based. And the issue of time. You cannot wait for a full-fledged RIA procedure. By the way, another great uh, uh, research project is the relationship between RIA and crisis. You need RIA way more in crisis, but we don't have an RIA methodology that is... Uh, uh, geared towards crisis situation. I'm closing that bracket. Um, so because you don't have time, then the executive says, trust me because you guys, the institutional feature of a parliament is that it, it's going to take more time. You need to reach some pol political deals. Um, you need to hear the opposition. People want to have some airtime. There are other incentives that, that are in place give me more power. Now, from the perspective of the government, therefore, the parliament is a nuisance. And we saw that in Israel clearly when the prime minister says, oh, lo and behold, the rule of law demands that I get parliamentary approval for this. And that. Well, let's get rid of it. We, we, we should amend the law. And this is what actually they did. They amended the law in order to reduce, and this is a unique, 
in order to reduce supervision because it takes more time and it's a nuisance and and um now there's another alternative the alternative model is to use emergency regulations and our instinct is to say that emergency emergency regulations are actually a sign of weakness because the government is taking more power uh but I'm not sure what is better to have emergency regulation or to have the type of general uh, laws that are not emergency regulation. So legisprudence wise, parliament works, parliament considers, but de facto what happens is there is a delegation of power and, and, and a less supervised delegation of power. And I think you touched upon it in one of your, in one of your comments, uh, not in this lecture, but in other places. And so I think that's worthy of another, another research there. Um, Another point I want to make about leg legisprudence, and again, I'm trying to be very brief here. I think our field of legisprudence is too narrow if we focus only on legislatures. So legisprudence can be the lawmaking power of parliaments or legislatures, or legisl legisprudence can mean all lawmaking power, including the lawmaking power of governments. And here, if you focus your, your legisprudence to include secondary legislation, what we call, either emergency regulations or other bylaws that are issued by, by the government, we see something fascinating. Why? Because you would think that once you move to the government, you would, you would reach, it would be easier to reach consensus because it's a government and you have coalition agreements. And, and in fact, you see great disagreements within the government itself. Uh, so I think it's, it's, and some of the compromises that are reached are compromises that mimic legisprudence type of compromises and not executive type of, of compromises. So because of the lawmaking power. So I think that that's another point to, to um, be careful when we, when we, when we talk about, about those issues. Um, now, I think that what's unique about the relationship between parliament and the executive in emergencies, again, given the fact that there is no time, is the question of institutional bias. Um, so the theory goes that, to follow your analysis, is that there is a risk in crisis situation to overestimate the risk, not only because of psychological song of the siren, uh, sirens uh, uh, features, but also because of a, a, a known institutional bias, according to which people do not want to be associated with great failures. So if you do not act and then something very bad happens, you're going to be remembered, your legacy is going to be the legacy of the person who failed, the head of this. So you're going to take extreme measures on the other side, just so it's not going to be on your no, on your nose. For example, the, the, um, Director General of the Minister of Health in Israel, a guy who was not a doctor, but, uh, but an, uh, his expertise in economics, uh, advocated for very harsh measures, including complete shutdown of the economy, because he did not, again, the explanation is that, you know, if there were a greater number of, of, of deaths, it would be under his name. You were the Director General. So, so that's a clear case of an institutional bias. Now you need parliament and you need the courts. So I'm not talking about courts now, but you need parliament to offset the institutional, uh, institutional bias because the, the understanding is that parliament can in a way inquire for the executive, are you really overreacting here or not? Because the idea is that parliament in a way is somehow better in integrating and synthesizing the different pools of the economy and uh, the health and the security and just because people care about different things in parliament. Um, and we see this actually in operation. So um, we see, so, so you, I'm not sure that the conclusion you reached that the committee itself put only minor blocks and therefore it's the exception that shows the rules. I think that actually the government knows that it's not gonna get an easy time in this committee because they're gonna talk about the economy and they're gonna talk about what is the balance between this, that and the other. 
in order to offset the institutional bias in a way. So I wouldn't, even though it's a national coalition, or even though there's no opposition in coalition de facto, I, I would not underestimate this a feature of the institutional dialogue between the parliament and the executive. And you even see that with respect to the contact tracing, they allow them, the government to do that, but they limit the time. So they say, we want to hear from you again. We want to hear from you again. Come to us again. Why would they want to do that? Well, they want to do that because they don't really trust that that actually is working. The last point I want to make is with respect to the experts, and I will conclude here. Um, <clears throat> and I think you're right that, uh, that be careful what you wish for. We don't want to have a purely technocratic regime whereby you shift everything to the experts, in part because experts also have institutional biases. They see only their expertise. Um, but again, um, um, if there is one thing that we know from emergency studies is that during emergencies, you want to recruit more and more experts. You want to make sure that the panel of experts is diverse. So you switch from one expert to a panel of experts. And you have many of these. You have experts on this and experts on that. And then, and then you have greater buy-ins. We see that in Germany, they worked by the book. They did the right thing in terms of experts. Stage one in Israel, you saw the opposite. There were only hand-selected some experts, some got, some didn't get. And even now, you still do not have in Israel a fully-fledged notion of experts. And this is a point of failure to the legislature. Why? Because the legislature can harness the experts to a greater extent, simply because it, it, you know, it has in its capacity the ability to invite more opinions to committee meetings. Um, whereas the government might say, I don't want to hear from you and I don't want to hear from you. Um, so I wonder whether um, you can say something about that as well. I conclude. Well, thank you very much, Amon. Very illuminating comments, and there's a lot here, so I apologize in advance that I won't be able to respond to all of it uh, as, as, as it merits. So I'll start with your, uh, in reverse order, in, in your last two points about uh, the institutional bias and the experts, because I, I agree with you that they're both related. So I completely agree. I think that, that ideally what was supposed to be in government, if, if, in my personal opinion, I mean, I have no uh, 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 arguments against or, or criticism of, of the Ministry of Health. I mean, their agenda, what they want to do is to reduce as many sick and dead people. I mean, that's their role. And they want to protect the, the hospitals from overflowing, etc. But ideally, you'll have the Ministry of Health promoting the most extensive measures possible. And then you'll have the Ministry of um, Justice saying, well, what about rights? And then the Ministry of... Uh, finance saying, well, what about the economy? And even maybe the Ministry of Tourism says, what about tourism, etc. What happened, I agree with you that the government, uh, it seems, at least from the outside, we know that's one of the advantages of parliaments that it's uh, transparent and in the government, we don't really know what happens. But what, what we, from what we heard in, in the report, it seemed that you're right, that uh, they, they took the medical uh, uh, Professions' uh, views as the only uh, uh, consideration. So, so I agree that uh, uh, we see this, and, and the idea would be experts from various aspects giving their inputs. And I completely agree with your point about the institutional bias and, and the fact that Parliament is actually, uh, uh, although theoretically we, you talked about RIA, you know that in RIA also there is supposed to be public consultation, etc., in the government stage as well. But in practice, Parliament is much uh, uh, better suited and, and, uh, and institutionally capable of hearing various different uh, opinions and experts. And we actually saw it a few times in Israel. If you take the surveillance, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. great example mm -hmm. because people from Privacy Israel, for example, came and they are privacy experts and also technological experts saying, listen, there's actually alternatives that could be more effective or at least no less effective and much more uh, 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 promoting of privacy, or at least less infringing on, on, on privacy. Uh, and you have the Society of Epidemic Experts uh, uh, coming to Parliament saying, listen, this is the wrong path. So I completely agree. I think this is one of the justifications of Parliament. And, and by the way, 
it's, it's coming to the same as Netanyahu, as he said. Netanyahu said that, you know, uh, the rule of law and parliament are just a hassle, and, and they're the reason that we cannot actually deal with the COVID-19 pandemic properly. I think this proves that uh, it's not only that it's, you know, because of democracy and the importance of oversight and rule of law, you have to, you want to have parliament. Actually, it could actually help the effectiveness because the, or the optimal decision making does take into account experts from outside of government and various perspectives. So I completely agree with you. I also completely agree about your points that legislators should cover uh, uh, regulation, secondary legislation, and other forms of legislation, not only parliamentary legislation. I, I can be quick because I agree. Um, about uh, your, uh, about uh, whether emergency regulations is preferable, that's a very big dilemma that I can say that I personally also am grappling with. And, and especially, I think the alternative usually is not the old fashioned and, and, tempor and, and uh, permanent legislation. I think the uh, alternative in parliament would be sunset legislation or temporary legislation. And, and the question is whether you'd prefer temporary legislation over emergency regulations. My, this is a whole new, uh, a different paper, but very briefly, my intuition is that I would prefer temporary legislation if it would be done properly. But, we, but in terms of its potential, I think it's it's a better alternative. Um, the, the fact that uh, there's no time uh, uh, and, and there's no evidence. I agree, I think this is one of the unique features, especially at the beginning, but it's even now, that even the experts disagree. When we saw it first, they said masks do not help, and then they say, yes, masks do help. First they said, children cannot uh, 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 get uh, uh, COVID-19 or pass it, and then they said, yeah, they can. Uh, first they said, if you were infected once, you're immune, and then say, no, maybe you're not, or you're immune for a short time. There's actually very little credible evidence. And as I said, I, I read more Lancet and the uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine journals than in my entire life. And my, again, I'm not a medical expert, but my estimation is that even the experts still do not know a lot and, and, and disagree about a lot. And in this in respect, I agree with you that it's different than other situations. This creates another level of challenge. And this creates, among other things, and this is, again, I'm promoting another article from the theory and practice of legislation that we just published about whether it's uh, justified and correct to use the precautionary principle in this type of situations where there is no time for the traditional evidence-based lawmaking process. So uh, I think a very good point that I agree. About the comparative aspects, my, I agree with you that uh, there's always a trade-off between large end that gives you a, a very broad picture, but very shallow picture, then uh, a, a small end that you get a very in-depth picture, but of course, perhaps less uh, general, generalizable. Uh, and I, uh, my personal opinion is, is for multi-method projects that uh, will do both, and hopefully we will do both. And I completely agree that Germany and Israel is a very good uh, uh, candidate for, uh, for comparison. And I agree that uh, I, I did get feedback from colleagues from Germany, from a number of them. And it seems that Germany in many respects, not only in terms of the country in general, has, has uh, uh, been quite uh, effective in, in meeting the COVID-19 challenge and also maintaining its democracy, but, but also in parliament, parliament has worked pretty impressively. So I think it's a very good example for comparison. Thank so you. we have a chief, well, we have a chief together. Here, here we go. Here. Uh, Itai, uh, there are two, at least two more people who want to speak. Um, and I think that we should probably uh, aim to end around 3.30. There's also a comment from Deborah earlier on about uh, Hong Kong. Um, I, I suggest that uh, Robert and Rotem each ask their question. Um, relatively quickly, and then you take them both uh, together, if that's okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you, Itai, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And I think the, uh, I'm looking forward to waiting to read more about the comparative issue, which is uh, uh, very important here. Uh, my comments slash questions uh, slash suggestion is, that we have not seen just a, crisis, a, a clash of two crises, the countervirus crisis and the political crisis, but of three. It is joined by a, a crisis, a third crisis, a doctrinal and a regulatory crisis that we have 
uh, on the uh, in all of the uh, emergency regulations here in Israel. Uh, we are working currently with, together with Professor Zatzelga and Shlomo Mizrahi uh, on this uh, issue. Um, so what we have witnessed, for example, is, uh, and we're still witnessing people blaming each other for each one's, uh, who's, who's guiding, who's, uh, whose directive uh, uh, is the more, uh, is the one that uh, should be given here. Um, the role of the army, the role of other uh, functions here in the, uh, in the country, you've seen a um, uh, shift. What happened is that we had to shift from a very draconic um, regulations that we had from going up to the 40s uh, directly to new, a new uh, uh, legislation, and it has to go through the Knesset at this time, uh, to deal with the controversy because we don't have something that is going on all the time. So my suggestion slash question is uh, wh whether this uh, issue affected what we have seen and uh, made, it, made it even uh, a bigger issue. Um, the second question I had, I don't know, it's, uh, uh, you said the second stage was more, and you, you've seen more parliamentary uh, oversight. Is it, is it so, did we really see more parliamentary uh, oversight? Or we, how, did, were we more aware at that point of the, the, the importance of parliamentary oversight? I heard your ISA issue example. Uh, I'm not sure whether it, that, that was the unique, uh, uh, and you should look at the coronavirus committee intervention, not only where it actually intervened at the end of it, but there were cases that the government itself uh, uh, erased some uh, uh, of the regulations they put on the table of the committee. I'm, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, um, delete or uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the, we've seen a kind of a decrease in the, uh, in the oversight here. Uh, so, I'll leave it here. Rotem, please. Hi. So, uh, thanks. It was very interesting. One quick thought. Um, I, I want to push you a little further on this issue of parliamentary oversight not collapsing uh, in the end or becoming stronger in the end. And I, I found myself wondering throughout your, your lecture whether it was not actually the other way around and what we're witnessing here is actually closer to the collapse of government and not of parliament. Because I think that if you ask a lot of people in the Israeli public, they will tell you that the government is not doing all that well managing COVID-19, that what they're seeing here is not a demonstration of strength and power, but rather a demonstration of weakness, not of sort of, uh, and, uh, and dysfunction. And maybe the best indication is that the government itself didn't convene for a month, right? I mean, they didn't meet, I think for four weeks, we're talking about parliament being able to meet, but really the government, wasn't really functioning. Um, so this brings me to sort of uh, my, my, my question or thought is, and I don't know if there's any empirical evidence on this, at least not yet, but on whether this, these attempts to sort of, um, um, you know, weaken parliament and, and take more power into uh, the, the hands of the administrative branch or government itself, whether this is actually effective at all in combating these types of crises of, of pandemics, because it seems to me that if the, if the answer is no, and actually, you know, countries that do have parliamentary oversight and strong democracies did better facing the pandemic, it seems to me like the best way of convincing people that democracy shouldn't collapse just because we have a pandemic, not despite the fact that we have a pandemic, but because we need a strong democracy in order to fight these types of, of problems. Okay, Taya, final word. Oh, wow, final word. So, okay, so I won't answer all of it, but thank you very much, Robert and, and Otem, for very helpful and illuminating comments. So uh, maybe I'll, the final word would be the sec answering the second question of, of Otem. Uh, whether it's more effective to be a democracy or a centralized, I think this is one of the biggest risks that we saw, is that you saw in a lot of uh, Western countries, People saying, oh, we should learn from China and we're, they're so fortunate that they're so centralized and uh, if we, we just not have been so democratic and had all these courts and, and uh, legislatures and oversight, uh, we could have been very effective. 
unfortunately, I don't have time to rebut all those arguments. I can say that there are studies of previous pandemics showing that democracies actually uh, uh, answer pandemics and cope with pandemics better than uh, autocratic uh, uh, countries. And I did not, do not have time to have more uh, uh, arguments about it, but we mentioned throughout uh, some of the things that I also answered to Amno that why I think that parliaments are not only justified because of we need democracy and separation of powers, but also they contribute to the effective, effectiveness. So it's not really a trade-off between democracy and being effective. It's, uh, uh, first of all, even if there's some price to pay in terms of the effectiveness, it's, we, it's worth, worthwhile to pay to maintain our democracy. But actually, uh, showing this as a dilemma is often a, a, a very common argument, very common by governments, but very often untrue. So I'll, I'll finish here and thank you all very much for the wonderful comments. Thank you so much, Itai. It was fascinating and very, very timely. Um, we'll uh, provide food for thought for, for a while now, I'm afraid. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Thank you very Bye, much. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much. It was fascinating. Bye. Thanks. תודה רבה, היה מצוין.